Ladies and gentlemen, so welcome to today's webinar. I, I think we're going to kick start now for people that is going to join us late. Uh, you can actually watch the recap. This is a recording. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, you can also uh, ask questions, etc. cetera, sort of thing. So um, my name is Jeffrey Tay. I'll be the moderator as well as the host today. Uh, when I say that, uh, there's really not much I will do uh, as, apart from uh, facilitating questions from the floor as well as uh, uh, asking questions as I go along uh, with all the uh, comments, insight and presentation for today. Okay. Now, um, we noticed that um, the world of um, uh, CFO um, is changing as um, transformations uh, no limited, not limited just to digital are now uh, impinge on even the most traditional businesses. Uh, you know, before we come on board for this particular webinar um, and manage to uh, talk to uh, uh, a number of uh, speaker for today, uh, they also be, you know, look at um, how traditional businesses has changed. Now, not only do CFO have to extend their reach across more connected business model, but they also need to fill the gap on changes that are taking place um, uh, to provide effective control environment and the bottom advice. The CFO Connects is a community designed for finance professionals to have access to a range of resources uh, for professional developments and business networking purposes. When I say this sentence, uh, I'm going to basically have a disclaimer. Um, we can't do this without your help and we can't do this with uh, a group of uh, CFO or finance professional coming together. Okay, we are not an association. Uh, we're not trying to do that or anything like that. We're just trying to build a community so that you know the uh, CFO or finance professional be able to have uh, access to our resources. So in coming month, we will host a smaller focus events to discuss a wide range of initiative. This could be M and A, could be compliance, could be AI machine learning uh, for your um, accounting or finance purposes. Anything. It could be fintech. It could be basically how to work with um, um, bank. Uh, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, whether your firm is investing in a greater Bay Area or going through a compliance exercise, we do hope your fellow CFO uh, in CFO Connects uh, can help. And uh, I do encourage you to join as a member. And when I say you enjoy the member, and this is the thing, all you have, uh, we will send you uh, membership forms. And membership is complimentary for now. Uh, we're not thinking about charging at all. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let's kickstart today's session. Um, so, Again, the CFO Connects event today prefer the short and sweet approach. Our presentation today is 15 minutes or less. Uh, it has to be precise and straight to the point. Uh, as your moderator today, I will be facilitating questions. I do encourage all of you to ask questions so I don't have to come up with all the questions. Okay, and that's basically what it is. Um, so I believe everyone's, uh, you have the agenda uh, and things that we will talk about today ranging from um, you know, the role of CFO and how uh, most of the CFO now is in rebuilding mode, uh, the future of finance, um, and also you know, CFO, uh, why CFO are in a unique position in bringing AI innovation to the enterprises. Uh, and, uh, and this particular topic is quite interesting because yesterday I had an uh, opportunity to talk to uh, one of the speaker called Peter McMillan, so Managing Director of APAC Donnelly Finance Solutions. He was walking me through that a lot of people thought that they, they're uh, developing digital transformation, but it's only buying tech. Not until that you're changing the way of um, worker behavior and, and how they deploy technology, how they uh, use AI innovations, uh, you, you are not complete that, that journey yet. So he will basically walk us through that as well. We will look at you know, uh, the digital future for banking, how FinTech and innovative technology are driving banking. Uh, Guillaume, you will, you will talk about that. Uh, and last but not least, innovation and agility, ensuring better business uh, outcome. Now, without further ado, uh, I'll pass it on to our first uh, uh, moderator for today, uh, David Newton, partner and co-founder for Trinity Bridge Asia. David Newton is also uh, a co-founder of CFO Connects, uh, and he and me basically have a lot of um, uh, uh, connections uh, uh, in, in the finance world. Uh, David came to Asia in 1991 with the Reuters, uh, fast forward, uh, I met David probably 12 years ago when he was a CFO for uh, LexisNexis uh, and uh, it's, it's been a very good working relationship with David. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, you know, he also basically uh, uh, resumed a lot of finance role uh, in media business, etc. Uh, so, you, you, you know, you can check out his LinkedIn, uh, it's all there. So, David, 
Can we pass it on to you? Now, before we do that, ladies and gentlemen, sir, if I could get you to just at the chat box to say hello to the uh, speaker or myself so that I don't feel like I'm talking to the computer all day long. In that chat box, if you can just say hello, good morning, uh, you know, that would be great so that I know you're here. Oh, actually, Peter just joined. Good morning, Peter. All right, we have a lot of hello and good morning now. David, pass it on to you. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Um, this first panel, we're going to explore the extent to which business is in crisis from the impact of the coronavirus and more pertinently, how the role of the CFO is evolving to navigate through those difficult times and uh, particularly the leadership aspects of the CFO. So I'm very lucky to have three excellent CFOs on the panel this morning. We're going to be hearing from Sabrina Khan at Aptorum and from Jörg Kornblum at Luentai and from Krish Schwaminath run at um, IBM Hong Kong. Um, so we'll start with a, the with a first question. I'll, I'll get each of the panelists to introduce themselves at the start of their first answer, I think is probably, probably the, the easiest thing. So the first question is going to be just simply what has been the biggest impact of the coronavirus on your business? So I'd like to start by passing that question across to Sabrina Khan, please. Oh, hi. Um, so maybe I will give a brief introduction about myself. So um, I'm now the CFO of the Tarm Group. So um, before joining Aptorum, actually, I was like before as an auditor and in my early career. And um, after I left and entered the 24-7 working mode, so I worked for a few like healthcare related companies focusing on doing IPOs and M&As in Hong Kong, China, um, US and Singapore. So um, for Aptorum Group, so we are a pharmaceutical company. Um, We're currently listed on NASDAQ and Euronext Paris. Um, so we license some therapeutic innovations from the universities targeting like um, some uh, currently unmatched medical needs. For example, um, infectious disease like MRSA and influenza, where we license them from Dr. Yoon Kwok Yong's lab. And also like cancer, including often oncology indications. So we also have a drug discovery platform, um, like where we continuously discover some new therapeutic assets through automatically screening the existing approved drug molecules. Um, just like a scientist where they discover like the existing HIV drugs can um, potentially heal COVID-19. So um, I think to us, we have the least impact among all other industries because um, people are more health conscious these days, and they put more focuses on healthcare and biotech related stocks as reflected from the recent stock price. So, um, so our operation um, doesn't really impact a lot by current COVID-19, but still like things did like slow down a little because um, some of our partners in US and Canada, they can't go to work because of the lockdown. So, um, but for biotech companies, things are really time sensitive. And if anything delayed, it would create huge impact to the stock price or to like on investors' expectation. So a scientists in Hong Kong still go to the lab as usual. And, um, but then we allocate some of the work to, um, to be done like um, by our CROs in, in Taiwan or elsewhere in Asia during this time and try to minimize the impact and catch up the progress of our existing projects. So, um, but as a biotech company, we do have frequent like financing activities and we have to attend different investment conferences. But before the outbreak, we have to travel to US pretty frequent, um, like at least once every, every two months. And now all these conferences have gone online because like um, um, of the COVID, so nobody can travel. And um, so, but then there are a lot of investment um, like those relations activities going on because maybe the cost of uh, hosting virtual conferences is much cheaper and um, so lots of things have been like arranged and um, so I think it's a good thing because this is more like time and cost efficient and you can join the meeting anywhere you want and you don't have to travel like 17 hours traveling to US and um, it brings the whole investor 
um, like community much closer because we arrange like lots of those webinar and um, investors have the opportunity to, to talk or listen to the company directly and to listen to the first hand information from the company. So I think um, to us is um, have a positive impact on our on our like the industry too. Um, would, would you say that that um, those changes are going to be temporary or permanent? I mean, sounds as if you enjoy traveling less, may I say. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, yeah, how, how do you see things playing? Assuming that COVID is all in the past, do you see business model having changed? Um, actually, I do quite enjoy like traveling. At least I can go to different places to do my shopping. <laughs> <laughs> so and to meet like different people and enjoy the food there. But um, yeah, but sometimes like traveling too much is is a pain. Like uh, seeing the plane for seventeen hours, going to the states, it it like uh, wastes lots of time traveling. Um, but I think this change is, I would say, is permanent. Because um, at the beginning, people are kind of reluctant to, to have a change because we are getting used to this kind of working mode. Uh, we have been doing it for years. And now because of COVID, everybody around is doing it. And you don't have the choice that to start adapting to, to this change or else you just can't survive. So I'm sure many of us have gone through like a hard time during the transition period, jumping out of a comfort zone, cope with the like new working um, style and stop something we have been doing for for ages or trained for years and start doing something that is totally new and we have never tried but um it's not easy but i think people already get through it and um lots of us are happy with the change like um just during this time we find it like um work is as usual and it's um, more flexible. We can work from home and some of the, like um, my colleagues can be home uh, spending more time with their parents or taking care of the kids. And um, we, I think um, without this opportunity, it won't force us to try some new things or think of a change. And like, we are now using more like um, AI to assist us or to use more like um, cloud or those kind of things to help us. So, um, and now we get through it and it's a great breakthrough. And I think it's more, I think it's a good change as well because we have to cope with the, like this global trend as well. So I think it's more like a permanent than, than like a temporary. Okay, great. Well, if I'm going to move to the tech sector next and to Krish, if you could tell us a bit about yourself and then the impact of the coronavirus on the IBM business. Yes. Hi, good morning, everybody. So my name is Krish Saminath. And so I've been with uh, IBM for um, you know more than 25 years now. Uh, I started initially uh, in India for about five years and then uh, for about 20 years in Singapore in a variety of uh, functional and regional roles. And then last uh, couple of years in Hong Kong, uh, as the CFO here, and I've been uh, CFO of IBM Singapore and also of our uh, financing business across Asia Pacific. So, you know, a variety of roles. Uh, coming to the impact of uh, COVID, uh, I mean, I would say that it's a mixed bag. Uh, See, so on the negative side, I mean, most of our uh, uh, clients are impacted in some way or the other. In some industries, a lot more, like for instance, travel and transportation, uh, retail, hospitality, you know, these are all severely impacted as we all see around, you know. So when our clients are impacted, of course, we are also impacted uh, from that sense. And uh, the other thing which is happening is uh, many of the clients are, uh, are uh, not rushing into decisions on major investments, right? They want to take their time, to see how things pan out. Uh, so you're seeing some delay in decisions. And uh, we all know the saying, right? Delay kills deals, right? So we are also seeing that to some extent. But the silver lining is uh, uh, our business is, uh, has got a lot of services content. So there is an inherent hedge uh, of an annuity business. So, you know, 60, 70% of our business is uh, annuity driven. So, uh, so we get some cushion from that. The second thing which is happening is um, there is a lot of digitalization happening, right? So. Uh, so we do uh, tend to participate in, uh, in, in helping our customers shift to more digital mode of operations. Uh, and the third thing is uh, when, uh, uh, you know, when 
the clients need to cut down and then maybe tomorrow they need to ramp up. Uh, it's difficult to make those uh, divestments and investments in house. So what uh, we have found is our, our managed services outsourcing type of businesses where we can scale up or down uh, quite flexibly. You know, that has got a bit of traction, I would say, in helping our clients to, uh, to uh, cope up with the uh, uncertain business environment. So I think this is uh, in net what we see, uh, you know, from, from our perspective. And again, do you see this being a permanent change or yeah, you think so, with decision, maybe decisions are made a bit more quickly when the COVID virus is over and perhaps business models shift back a bit? Right. So I think uh, certain things will come back, I'm hoping. Uh, uh, you know, like, for instance, when tourists start coming in, travel opens up, though it may take a little bit longer, you know, maybe two to three years. Uh, but I think that part of it will catch up. Uh, things which, are, uh, which were done in the traditional way and now because of digitalization and the new way of doing things, I think those are more permanent shifts. And, uh, you know, we'll have to cope up with that, you know, so from uh, more brick and mortar to more online. And uh, I think that will be a major shift uh, going forward. Okay, thanks very much, Krish. Finally, I'd like to go to the manufacturing sector and to, to Luen Tai with, uh, with Jörg. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm happy to join this morning's uh, discussion here. Um, I myself, my name is Jörg Kornblum. I'm uh, in Asia since 97 in Hong Kong, so actually quite a while. I'm originally um, a mechanical engineer and studied business administration both at the same time. So not the very typical CFO qualification, I guess, but I've spent actually uh, my entire career mostly in the commercial sector um, as CFO or in other commercial roles. Um, but then also for quite a while under Lun Thai, I have been running uh, one of our business divisions in the, in the fashion trading, buying office business uh, across Southeast Asia. So I have been also very operational um, uh, leading and heading a business here before uh, becoming CFO of Lun Thai Group. We are a manufacturer um, uh, traditionally coming from the apparel sector. Um, in, in recent years, having our business also in the accessories for ladies' handbags. Um, and uh, we are producing out of nine different countries in China and Southeast Asia. So we have been across the board for a while. Uh, now coming to the impact uh, of COVID to us, um, um, slightly different from what Sabrina and Chris could say, uh, actually, we are on the other end. We are not the hotel or airline industry but we are then one of those industries also very, very hard hit. Um, kind of it started in, in early this year, February, March, with uh, obviously the first cases and, and uh, impacts from China, which uh, had a big impact on also our supply chain for raw materials. Um, and then it, uh, of course, went from country to country. Uh, it uh, quickly, of course, impacted our key customers in a big way with lockdowns across the world, with uh, shops uh, that had to close. Um, we, we saw a big impact in the sense of customers canceling orders, asking us to hold shipments, um, implying uh, extended payment terms overnight, even for existing receivables. So the, especially the second quarter this year was uh, a, really a quarter of a lot of firefighting. Um, nothing which we as CFOs are not used to, uh, but it came in, in, a, in a big, big wave, no doubt. And uh, obviously, uh, as you can imagine, with, as I said, customers either extending payment terms from one day to the other, or even some customers going into financial difficulties. Uh, you heard about a number of brands who, who are even today still in difficulties, for sure. Um, that meant we also faced certain cash crunch. Our normal cash flow wasn't working anymore, right? So we had to look into a lot of um, areas there. My focus was uh, very, very much on, on that side as well, making sure we have uh, sufficient liquidity at all times, you know, and that we plan ahead what's going on. Uh, at the same time, you can imagine cost uh, saving and restructuring activities again across the board across the countries um, have been affecting us uh, quite a bit 
um, inventory management, um, uh, another thing, suddenly we were faced with inventory, which normally as a apparel manufacturer, you, you don't have ready goods inventory, but uh, if your customer suddenly ask you to hold uh, shipments of 30, 40 million US dollar value, uh, then you have to even cope with that and, and have to find a way to deal with these things. So that were maybe the key impacts. And I mentioned that uh, a little earlier in some chit chat we had this morning um, for the garment apparel industry manufacturing, already an industry um, extremely competitive and under pressure uh, and uh, so that uh, COVID pandemic and, and the impact certainly hit us in, in a big way. Um, I know your question is about permanent or temporary. <laughs> yeah, I guess you're, guess you're hoping this is temporary. <laughs> yeah, I, I think part of it, uh, I would agree with Chris, a part of it is, is certainly temporary, even if temporary doesn't mean a month or two, rather a year or two uh, as a temporary impact, so a longer temporary phase, um, but a lot of uh, um, things that kind of were now forced or created by the pandemic um, will stay with us, you know, and, and uh, nothing kind of will really go back to where we were and how we handled things uh, maybe a year ago. So I, I really believe that has changed a lot. The work environment, the, the tools, the yeah, digitalization in any case, we, we have been on that path already. Um, we definitely accelerate, uh, accelerated already in the past few months and are still keen to you know, move in, in even higher speed in that direction to have more flexibility and, and you know, get these tools really into working uh, mode. Okay, thanks very much. I'm going to change the order of the respondents. So I'm going to come to you for the second question first, Jörg. And um, we really just want to talk for a little while about um, all these changes that have happened. Has it changed your role as a leader of the business as a CFO or, or is it much the same? Um, on, on one side, I would say, obviously, a CFO role um, has already been changing in the past years. Um, I, I, I'm not saying I'm, I'm the best example, but I'm probably also one example. You know, usually maybe 10 years ago, you would hardly find uh, people who are not qualified accountants, you know, from their education to run a CFO position uh, and, and uh, those responsibilities. So um, I, I think all of us have been already much more involved in business strategy and decisions, uh, being a member of, you know, the executive management team, obviously in the C-suit, but, but also, uh, you know, with uh, all kinds of other uh, executives uh, in, in managerial roles. So I personally would say my advantage is that I have been running business myself. So I have been on that operational side and responsibility as well, because one thing we needed uh, to do now very, very much, if it was about inventory, about payables or whatever, um, you cannot just, you know, look at figures, turn around and say, customer wants now 120 days payment terms. Uh, we just imply the same to all our material vendors and that's it, you know, and you business unit leader, you please implement that. You, you have to understand what is doable, what is practical. Um, and so you need to really know your business, not just know your, your numbers. So I think... Uh, again, that is not completely new, certainly not, but uh, one of the areas where people who have so far maybe not been that much involved in understanding how business is created, how business, you know, is hopefully running on a continuous sustainable basis, have now a, a much bigger need to, to really have that understanding and to discuss uh, with, uh, you know, all the other colleagues in, in other um, functions in, in, in the company. Okay, perhaps I'll ask that question next to Sabrina. Um, your role as um, a leader, as a CFO, is that, has that changed because of these, this crisis or, or not? Um, as a CFO, like people thought um, chief financial officer and we're focusing on finance, but actually CFO's role is more like um, we have to do everything. <laughs> like whatever the like um, the, the CEO doesn't want to do, then we have to like um, help it out. So um, actually currently I'm working on 
like for example, legal side or company secretary, or even like um, to manage the whole, like um, the back office, because whatever involved um, money, so we have to get involved. And everything needs like um, involving uh, like money. So that's why, um, but as well, I think um, CFO's role is more, um, more than just like on finance, but um, the entire business. And um, like right now, um, like uh, I have to, like because of the COVID, so um, lots of us work remotely and I have to be a leader and managing the back office and make sure like, um, like um, everything is going on well and um, won't be delaying anything, which will like create a chain reaction to the entire operation. Um, I think we're like um, helping the, the society as well. Why I'm saying that, because like um, for our company, we're doing biotech. So um, actually, as long as I can do well and to support the operation and make sure like we make payments on time, we're doing the reportings on time and make sure we support the R&D team well. So actually we are helping with the operation. We are helping with the, like, the development of the drugs. We are helping with the, the, the entire society as well. So um, I think um, um, uh, CFO is more than like just on the finance function, but we're like for, more on the business side. Yeah, okay. And, and Krish, at uh, IBM, um, yeah. are you involved in things outside of the more traditional finance areas? Are you leading, leading change elsewhere too? Yeah, I think uh, we, we are definitely required to participate more uh, with the business. Uh, the role itself has not changed, but I think the application has increased. And I would point out two or three areas. Like first one is uh, uh, I'm uh, part of the crisis management team uh, where we look at uh, our response to COVID, you know, what are the practices we should adopt, what we shouldn't, you know, to maintain health and safety of our clients as well as our employees, you know. So that's a very critical uh, thing, which in the normal course, you not have uh, a day-to-day -day operational involvement. Uh, the second thing is how to help our business in this tough times, um, you know, to, to uh, you know, get across roadblocks, uh, which are uh, preventing uh, closing deals. So just to give an example, so one thing we did uh, starting the beginning of the year is uh, we moved to uh, digital signatures on contracts, like 100% like of our signatures, that is our own signature, signatories, sign on electronically on contracts. And then we are also encouraging our customers because many of them are also working from homes, you know, to leverage this uh, platform. Of course, some of them would like to have a wet signature on a contract, which is fine. But I think we are seeing a lot of traction on that. Uh, same, same thing on uh, getting our money, you know, collections, uh, we are leveraging more and more electronic transfers. We are leveraging lockbox arrangements uh, where we don't necessarily need to have uh, instruments come into the office. It can go into a lockbox and directly get credited to a bank account. So these operational uh, changes or adaptation, I would say, according to the need of the situation, is very critical for us to uh, help our sales teams to grow the business and also to maintain liquidity. Okay, thanks very much. Um, probably one, I'm slightly conscious of time, so uh, probably one final main area to, to talk about, and that's going to be really um, the, the changes in the business model and the, and the volatility going on means that um, the risk model for businesses has changed quite a lot. And um, this, this inevitably involves um, a change in the relationships with stakeholders such as the board and other, other key investors or, or, or third parties. Um, so, Chris, to you first. I mean, are you finding how are you finding the relationship with stakeholders? Are you doing a lot more forecasting than normal? Are you updating risk models more often? And how's it impacted the the finance function overall? I think if we could package those things together yeah, in sure. one area, that would be great. Yeah, uh, I would say. I mean, we are a pretty mature organization with a well set management system, so I don't think the frequency has dramatically increased. But I would say that. Uh, the depth of some of the reviews and also to the extent, the levels to which it needs to go for approvals, I think that has changed, you know, because now uh, the perception of risk, uh, you know, cuts across uh, just the territory you are operating in. Uh, so, uh, and we are very conscious of, uh, when, when you can't control the external environment, we are very conscious of what we can control internally. So making sure that our E2R 
uh, it doesn't go out of control. So if the business is not coming in, then we have to take uh, efforts to, uh, to, to control our costs. You know, that is basically bread and butter of every CFO, right? So, so those are uh, aspects which are becoming more and more Again, uh, from uh, capital commitments and investments, uh, there is a reluctance to, uh, uh, you know, go in a big way unless we see some uh, improvement coming ahead. So those are all cautious decisions, which I think any prudent business uh, would, would take at this point of time. Okay, great. If I could ask a similar question to Jörg. Um, yeah, how is the um, finance function coping with all the changes that you're, um, you're going through? Um, perhaps to throw, I see a little question coming up on the chat box. And, um, you know, you mentioned before the, the difficulties of, of, of customers wanting longer payment terms. Are, you, are your banking partners, people like that, are they being helpful in, in, in financing arrangements and, and this sort of stuff? Perhaps you could um, tell us a little bit about that. Can I quickly see the, the list of attendees of the webinar? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, <laughs> all right. No, I'm happy to, to uh, say something on, on that topic. I think, uh, um, but but really, um, uh, banking and uh, insurance partners are usually very nice to you when the weather is fine, you know, and everything goes well. Uh, and they have a lot more questions uh, and uh, uh, a lot more demands when you know it's a bit rainy. Um, so, but uh, no, we are fortunate. We have uh, very good banking partners, good banking relationships, uh, which helped us. But uh, coming a little bit to the point Chris mentioned, uh, in, in, in fact, yes, what our relationship, not only to bankers, but also to our board members or shareholders, is really that in the past, obviously, they were interested uh, once a year or twice for the interim uh, uh, result announcement, you know, uh, what is happening otherwise um, on, a, on a normal monthly basis, our management reports with uh, revenue development by business units and, and with a bottom line uh, was good enough, you know, to keep everybody uh, informed. So now the, the request for much more detail and more detail on, you know, financial KPIs and how are we handling this as finance teams, you know, how do we work with our banks? How do we ensure our working capital? Um, how do we treat all that? So those analyses and, and questions um, um, or, or reports were much more in demand. Um, and um, again, in order to do that, it's not just to, to pre prepare an Excel sheet with you know, some numbers uh, next to each other. You really have to have an understanding of what does it mean to your business? What does it mean to your forecast? Um, you know, how can you um, suggest changes in the way you're doing business, in the way you deal with certain customers or suppliers um, to improve on those numbers if you need to. And we have done that by, for example, implementing a, a vendor payment program for our material suppliers. Uh, we were used to getting that offer from some of our you know, big brands as customers. We usually didn't use it because it was more expensive than our own financing terms but um, so now we offer that to our material supp suppliers as well who have a similar cash crunch and you know working capital needs um, so new tools and, and also for let's say my finance teams um, uh, in the head office as well as across uh, you know Southeast Asia uh, again yeah people had to uh, get out of their comfort zone make sure they can work digital they can work from home, they can, you know, do things um, in, in slightly different way and yeah, sometimes at a higher frequency even as, as before and, and uh, that is what's happening. So yeah, I think I answered that one question of the chat. The other was if we had some receivables to write off, uh, yes, unfortunately. Uh, I, I won't mention names here, but uh, yeah, we, we have uh, some customers who went into, uh, you know, financial difficulties. And again, the way reacting on that was more um, really talking, negotiating directly with uh, the customer, finding you know ways and making proposals how we together get through those times. And uh, that's actually the part I kind of enjoyed as well because I, I got that very direct involvement in dealing with, with uh, some of our key customers. And how's your finance team managing? Because it's quite a lot of extra work for them by the sound of it, and they managing to 
get home at a sensible time and have a bit of a work-life balance still, or is oh, it? Oh, oh yes, uh, I'm, I'm actually, sometimes I have to push them out, but uh, I think that's a bit what, what Chris said, same for us. We are a mature organization. It's not that we are, we, we, we have our, you know, obviously standard procedures. We have been already uh, on the way for a, a, a higher digitalization of our tools and, and the way we work. So, um, yeah, I, I think uh, that was handled quite, quite smooth. Okay, and back to Sabrina again on this one. Again, um, yeah, NASDAQ listed, a lot of questions coming. You're in a hot area of, um, you know, a, a hot sector where maybe you're trying to develop a, a COVID vaccine yourselves, perhaps, who knows? And, um, you know, so, so um, how are you managing the demands of the stakeholders? Um, we didn't develop the, the vaccine, but we do have, like, we use our drug discovery platform and discovery a few drugs, um, a few existing drugs in the market, which is in an infectious disease area, which can um, potentially heal um, COVID-19. So um, lots of different companies, um, biotech companies are working in different areas. Some are working on the test and some are working on the treatment and some are working on the vaccine on the prevention side. So um, I think um, there should be something like in the market by the end of the year. And um, when some sort of like we're listed on NASDAQ, so um, there are some expectations from the investors. But I would say like during this time, we get closer with the stakeholders. Um, from management to investors. So we have more frequent um, virtual meetings with the board and um, to update them the status and operation and also our projects and also the potential impact on our business due to COVID-19. Um, because lots of uncertainties in the market, stock market is a bit volatile. So we want to make things um, as transparent as we can and to give more comfort and confidence to them. And um, so we have more frequent calls with the directors and also our working partners from overseas. And every time before starting a meeting, actually people are trying to update one another the status of uh, COVID in the area. And we also sent face masks um, to US and to Canada. So I would say the virus did create lots of issues to society, like causing deaths and also, um, or, or permanent health problems or even like hurt the economy badly. But at the same time, I think it brings people like closer. And um, it's, um, I think people are more understanding and help one another like out during this time. You can see Ferrari or Green Tie, they're working, um, producing face masks and um, some of the companies like working on a vaccine or a treatment of COVID. So I think it helps to bring people together. Right. Okay, um, so one or two more questions coming through. We have five minutes to go. <laughs> um, I was perhaps just going to uh, summarize a little bit on, um, on three things that I've, I've deduced from maybe what you've been talking about. Um, the first thing is that most, most companies um, and finance functions seem to have um, already been on a path to become more digital, but in fact, the COVID-19 situation has been a catalyst to push people faster along that path towards digitization, um, partly because of the practicalities um, of, of working remotely and all, these, and all these things. So that seems to be a positive long-term change, I, I would deduce from what you've been saying. Um, we've also talked about the fact that there is less business travel going on, and um, that's partly good, partly bad. We like to travel and shop in different locations. Um, however, we don't like to get on a plane and travel 17 hours completely all the time. So um, it's likely, I think, that, that when the world comes back to normal, that um, there will be some business travel, but probably not as much as we're used to in the past. And that probably will lead to long-term cost savings for some of the businesses. And the final thing is that this whole process of um, risk management and more frequent interactions with um, the board and other stakeholders, I, I think it means that the CFO role is going to have a closer relationship with a broader range of, of people around the business, uh, both internally and externally. So um, I, I think regardless of the sector that we're in from, from what you guys have been saying. Um, Jeffrey, do you want any questions from the, from the floor or anything? Do you think that- I think you, you did a very good job as a moderator. You also look at the question and answer all of it, but we do have a couple of questions. Uh, I, I wouldn't directly just uh, for, I know the question is for Sabrina. 
Um, only a rumor, okay, uh, that U.S. SEC is required to list all Chinese, uh, all, sorry, all listed Chinese firm to comply with U.S. Uh, GAAP yeah. GAP requirements. Uh, I wouldn't, so I'm, I'm not sure it would impact uh, whoever, but uh, Rob Agnew uh, kindly uh, uh, helped to also put a comment here saying that the panelists are here in all businesses with China and U.S. lag. Has the politic of COVID ha had an impact? Has the politic of COVID had an impact? So how can we address this question? Uh, maybe I can answer first. Okay. Um, so um, in terms of the like the US um, for admin's question. So um, I know there's a list like with all the um, Chinese um, firms, US listed firms on, on that list. Um, actually, uh, many of those are, are audited by Big Four, but then they're audited by um, the Big Fours in, in China. So in China, they have an issue, like they don't open the books to um, like the PCAOB, the accounting regulatory parties in, in US. And that's why, because kind of political issues that um, like the big fours in China, they are not allowed to open the books for the inspection. And that's why the US SEC tried to like blacklist. But um, I think they're trying to sort that out, but it doesn't really impact on us because we engage um, a US like local audit firm to do an audit for us. And that's why we're not on the list. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks for any, anything from the others? Any, anything from Jörg on, on the politics of COVID? I mean, we heard at the start of the US-China trade wars that supply chains were being kicked out of China and maybe into Vietnam and other places. Any of that sort of stuff? Yeah, I mean, um, let me say on that side, I, I don't think that COVID alone now, of course, you know, uh, drove, uh, uh, you know, customers with their request for supply um, uh, outside China. That, that happened again already much earlier. Um, very early in the year, yes, when COVID just appeared in, in China first, obviously, uh, then customers uh, got nervous about their China production and were happy if companies like ours, you know, had uh, production capacities in a big way outside China. So, um, but, um, but that was very short lived because, uh, I mean, very, very quickly, uh, it has not been China only. Uh, all countries worldwide have been affected. So, um, you know, even even if you look at it today, the lockdowns in, in the Philippines, in, in, in India, are still affecting us uh, far, far more at this moment uh, than uh, what, what happens in China. So um, COVID itself, I wouldn't say had, had that major impact. The US-China trade war, the overall relationship uh, between US and, and China in, in the past few years now, um, that certainly has a, 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 even a bigger impact. Again, COVID here and there put a little extra um, something on top of it, you know, um, but, but I wouldn't say that was the real cause. Okay. Okay, maybe, maybe, um, just, maybe just quickly, to, if we got one minute, maybe just quickly to Krish, any, any political issues kicking into the world of tech? Uh, I, I wouldn't say uh, there is anything directly related on the political side. Of course, uh, when, uh, when there are constraints on trade, you know, it has overall impact on economic development or the, uh, business growth. So to that extent, yeah, I think it, all of us may be impacted in some way or the other, but nothing uh, specifically, I would say, on the political side. Great. Over to you, Jeffrey. All right. Thank you, uh, David. Uh, thank you, all the uh, panelists. Uh, thank you, Sabrina, uh, York, uh, Krish. Uh, now, and also uh, some of the uh, speaker that just came on board to uh, provide comments. Uh, we're now moving to our second uh, uh, sessions, is what we call the short and sweet, <laughs> or the precise and concise, uh, to be more uh, diplomatic uh, uh, comments on that. Um, again, uh, uh, I welcome everyone to stay on board uh, if you uh, do have time. If not, well, thank you, uh, everyone, for your, uh, not the attendee, okay, uh, the speaker. Uh, thank you, the speaker, for the panelists, for your time for this morning. Uh, now we're going to uh, go to the second uh, uh, lack for this particular uh, event as presentation. For those who join us uh, earlier, I already mentioned it, what is CFO Connects. So for those who join us late, I'm just going to uh, take one minute 
uh, to talk to you what is uh, CFO Connects uh, and, uh, and what we hope to achieve here. And that's the thing. So CFO Connects is a community that we designed for financial professional, finance professionals, sorry, uh, to have access to a wide range of resources uh, for professional developments and business networking purposes. Now, when I say this, uh, we're still basically building this. So we need all of your help uh, in order to form this community. The membership is complimentary um, for now. Uh, and what we're trying to do is not to go to the draconian uh, conference style where you have to sit through five hours, 10 hours of uh, uh, slides or anything like that. What we're trying to do is basically hosting a lot of mini uh, events that uh, focus subject that are uh, um, beneficial for you. And most importantly, uh, uh, Guion uh, and most of the CFO love this evening thing where you can actually um, hold a whiskey or a cocktail while you talk. Is that, is that what it is, uh, Guillaume? Okay, he's not. Absolutely, uh, yes. <laughs> no problem. Okay, uh, I know I speak very quick because I just want to basically get to our, our next session. So next sessions uh, up, we have Sandrine Warnison. So Sandrine uh, will talk a to us on these uh, people and management issue. Uh, she's actually an accomplished business turnaround executive with over 20 years of corporate experience working with multinational companies. Uh, she's now currently working for Kiabi. Uh, do I, did I pronounce it right, uh, Sandrine, the name? Because some, sometimes yeah. French pronunciation is slow. Yeah, I know, but you got it pretty right. Thanks. <laughs> okay, <laughs> a, a French retailer as a Asia CFO. Uh, and uh, she has a strong experience in organization development, operation, and strategic planning. Um, and uh, in particularly uh, this morning, I had a chance to talk to her. Uh, they're now uh, thinking about producing really nice masks. Past you, uh, Sandrine. Thanks very much for this uh, nice introduction. And yes, we are indeed producing masks, uh, one of our new area of business. Um, so I don't have much to add uh, to your introduction, except that actually I'm not exactly a, a traditional uh, CFO, and I'm sure you will feel for me because I like last minute change, I like spontaneity, I like to look into the future, I hate routine, I get bored very, very easily, and I like discovery, adventure, no constraints and everything. So uh, now... I'm sure you all feel that I made really the wrong choice in becoming a CFO. Having said that, I really had uh, a lot of fun uh, in those uh, in those past years, uh, mostly because I used my um, my desire for change. And this era is, I would say, uh, full of uh, challenges and uh, and changes for most companies and uh, and how to turn around people, organizations, and everything. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to talk to you about uh, how we do an accountant, analyst, and mat mat machines uh, hybrid. Uh, and before I go into that, I, I would like to talk to you about a story. Uh, I used to live in China, and um, one of those times uh, I left a few years back, and then I came back uh, two years ago, and I went to my favorite hotel, and, uh, and then I was greeted by a robot. And uh, my Chinese is not super good, so I was like not understanding really what it was saying. Uh, so I went to the counter to do the check-in, and I was like, oh, well, this is new. I mean, I never saw that thing before. And they were like, what are you talking about? I said, yeah, the robot over there. I said, oh, yeah, this is our new colleague. And I was like, what do you mean? I said, yeah, he's helping us like, you know, to greet people, to uh, carry the language to the room and so on. And I was really stunned that they were not seeing it as competition. They were seeing it as this is our new colleagues. You know, this is uh, what is helping us to do our job. And it got me thinking that um, there is a way as well to, to sell robots and, and whatever is coming in terms of AI and so on to our teams so that they don't see it as competition, but they see it as help as how they can do their job differently. So my vision and, and what I'm trying to do currently in my company is not to have this regular, uh, I would say very traditional way of thinking of people and, and organizations like you have accounts payable, accounts receivable, 
uh, general ledger and then controller. Uh, I'm thinking it more in terms of analyzing all the tasks and looking at what is really um, uh, repetitive and can easily be delegated to a robot because honestly, it's not very interesting. And then the second layer would be more what is somehow repetitive, but still needs a little bit of human intervention and uh, will be complicated and, and costly, uh, not very cost effective to automate. And that is for people who are less qualified or people who, unlike me, get very happy with a routine job, with you know, uh, knowing what they're gonna do the day after. And then the last one, which is, and it can be across all areas of finance, uh, where it requires uh, thinking, where it requires analysis, where it requires added value uh, uh, for the business. And then when you think of it in that way, in terms of structuring your teams, uh, it, it allows you to, uh, to bring um, in automation without people fearing that it's going to take something from them. Uh, and so this is what I've been doing. I mean, I started this job um, a year and a little bit over a year, over a year at Kiabi in Hong Kong. And uh, when I arrived, uh, I was uh, stunned by the complexity of systems that we have uh, in, uh, in our company. I mean, normally when I start a new job, then I, my, my first entry to understand how things are working is to look at a system mapping and to say, okay, well, I understand the processes, I understand how things are being done in this company. But um, I, start, I started doing that at Kiabi and then I quickly gave up because uh, the company has built up a lot of tailor-made systems and plus buying already uh, 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 external solutions and trying to uh, map them all together um and that that results in something that is not very successful i have to say in terms of systems uh in us having an army of it people all based uh in the headquarter and uh, i am sure for those of you who work for international companies you know that it means that you're going to have to struggle to put your agenda your needs into the into priority uh, at the headquarter because they have other priorities and they're busy with something else. And, uh, and then I was looking at um, what my people were doing. And then I see them, um, I mean, we, we are sourcing, uh, a sourcing entity for the group here. So I see them spending their days entering invoices uh, into Oracle manually. And I was like, stunned, you know, that, uh, that they would have to do this type of job. And, and some of the people doing that are smart people, I mean, that, that could contribute to the business in doing something much more interesting. So I, I saw uh, that we have this situation and that, well, actually we have not much latitude to get our priority up to the agenda at the headquarter. So I work with IT uh, into looking into what a robot could do what OCR technology could do for us so that uh, we could read invoices, the robot could take the result of the reading and putting it into the system. And, uh, and this is what we are doing right now. And then I'm now gradually um, training my people to, uh, well, you don't have to do this boring task anymore. Uh, so let's see what else could be done and uh, how we can bring more added value to the group. So for instance, because we have released workload onto uh, accounts payable team, and uh, now we are taking more uh, active role into uh, operational treasury, which was uh, typically managed uh, from France, which is not very efficient because uh, all our suppliers are in Asia and uh, with the time difference and everything, uh, having all the uh, daily operational treasury managed from France really doesn't make sense. But we didn't want to have an army of people uh, in, in Asia, so it wasn't possible. So now it's possible and I, I'm, I'm slowly uh, uh, bringing them into my vision that, uh, okay, we're gonna still have some repetitive tasks and we have people who definitely don't want to do anything else than repetitive. We're gonna have the robot, which we named 
Ravi. Well, that was not my most uh, innovative moment, but well, who is part of our team, who is helping us to, uh, to do some of the, the tasks. And, uh, and now everybody talks about Ravi like it's a colleague. So um, I, I, I'm quite happy because my vision, my dream when I was coming into this hotel that uh, my team would also think of uh, the robot as a team member has finally arrived. So, um, so yeah, we have Robbie, we have people who do uh, like kind of repetitive, but uh, with a twist uh, task. And then the rest of, uh, of the team being in controlling, uh, being in uh, accounts payable, accounts receivable, uh, tax and everything, uh, they are working on more added value role. And they now come to me when they have something that is, they think like, yeah, you know, I'm doing that job. And I think actually we could automate it. What do you think? And then we look into solutions and then they come up as well with, but you know, this area of the business, uh, we've not been looking into that. I mean, we need to work more on processes. We need to put some more controls in that aspects. And uh, if I don't have this automotive, automation, I mean, repetitive tasks to do, uh, then I'll be able to do it. So it has come now as a not robot against us, but it's more like robot is going to help me to do to have a more interesting job. And, uh, okay. and that is not a given, but I'm, I'm quite happy. And I think this is the direction we need to go towards to now. Great. Sandrin cannot agree more. Now, okay, we have two questions. Uh, one is from me and one is from the audience. So the question number one is that obviously when you come into Asia, you see the draconians, uh, the legacy system and all that and stuff. You feel that, that you know, it must, you know, we must uh, implement change. How hard was that change when you implemented it? And what are the, uh, the, the challenges that you face that is that you're going to implement uh, uh, AI automation? Is that mean, does it mean that I'm going to lose my job? That's the first question, I, you know, staff would ask yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I've been in Asia for 20 years. So uh, I'm, I'm new to this job at KIAB, but uh, I worked in Asia for a very long time. So, uh, so I'm, I'm used to working with people. Yes, we had, of course, uh, uh, these questions and... Uh, and I didn't hide behind the questions because I was the one raising it and, and telling the people, okay, well, now we're going to have that. Does it mean you're going to lose your job? Well, it's pretty much up to you. You're going to lose your job if you don't want to do something else, if you don't want to learn, if you don't want to have a different task. Yes. Now, if you are willing to move into something more added value, you're not going to lose your job because it's not really... Uh, I mean, uh, to be honest, yes, I'm reducing a little bit because uh, you cannot keep the same level of uh, number of people, but I'm not changing that much the number of people, actually. I may be reducing by one or two, uh, but mostly I'm changing jobs. And uh, it's like everything. I, I think in Asia, we have the luxury of having people who are more attuned to change. I mean, from Chinese culture itself, it's normal that things are always in flux and that, and that what is today is not going to be tomorrow. I guess I would have a much harder job if I was back in France or in Europe in general, where I feel there is a much uh, stronger uh, resistance to change. Okay. Uh, so what you're saying that, you know, um, your team realized that these are, these are mundane, these are boring tasks, anything like that. Uh, they also want to change, but they just need to understand what this change is, and it's changes actually for the greater good that can add value to their role and to their career, not just uh, uh, as well as company growth as well. So next question is uh, from Christopher, Christoph, sorry, uh, we care be, um, so where this morning question is coming, is we care be a fashion retailer, uh, particularly impacted by COVID, okay? How to defend CAPEX for MT improvement in face of immense cash pressure? Well, uh, to be honest, we've been quite lucky that uh, we were not impacted as much as uh, a lot of our competitors. Uh, so we sell mostly in France, and I don't know if you follow the news in France, but there's been a lot of very major retailer uh, that had to go into uh, chapter 11 and then uh, close business. Uh, we didn't, uh, and, and we are doing quite good. So we've been impacting in the sense that 
Uh, of course, we are running low on stock in our stores and we've been struggling because our, our suppliers are in India, Bangladesh and China. So China is okay, but Bangladesh and, uh, and India has been uh, very severely affected by the COVID and uh, we have massive uh, delays in our uh, production. And we uh, uh, elected not to cancel any PO because that's, I mean, we want to be, um, we, we are very committed to our suppliers and even though we are in the most polluting uh, industry or almost one of the most polluting industry. My company does a lot around sustainability and building relationships with, uh, with uh, suppliers and everything. So bottom line is we are not being so affected by the COVID, luckily. And, uh, and the company is uh, very aware that they need to go towards automation, digitalization and everything, and not only in finance. So we are also looking into uh, digitalization around uh, the product creation process and now you can do and this is what COVID-19 has pushed for actually because we realized that we cannot do the same ways as working as we did before like we send a sample in France and then they approve and then they send it back we couldn't because people in France were not in the office or people in Bangladesh and India were not in the office and it was not at the same time so this has pushed a realization that automation is needed everywhere and that's how we can push capex through and and, and of course we um we uh we have to reduce uh, some headcount that's a given I i'm not gonna lie it's not like you automate and no job is impacted of course some jobs are impacted and that's how you justify it but beyond that there is a strong desire to go towards uh, digitalization and automation and they are using for instance in finance they are using me in Asia as a pilot to see what we do with the robot can does it work and then after that they're gonna implement that in the headquarter as well okay so do, you know there is a research saying that women CFO has a, a, a more um, likely to take chance and innovate uh, than a male CFO sorry gentlemen uh, <laughs> uh, and um, I'm not sure, you know, uh, uh, you know that that is the truth. But uh, so the article was saying that. With your note, uh, Sandrine, thank you so much for your insights and your knowledge. With your note on automation, I'd like to invite the next speaker, Peter McMillan from Donnelly Finance. Uh, he will then uh, follow your uh, comment on automations and uh, change. We'll talk about how and why CFO are unique position, bringing AI innovation to the enterprise. Sandra, you are welcome to basically uh, ask any questions that Peter may, may uh, uh, have during his presentation as well. And everyone are welcome to do so. Peter, go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Jeffrey. And thanks everyone for inviting me to, to talk here today. It's uh, great to hear some of these discussions and actually what's uh, really interesting, some of the comments Sandra made uh, made uh, just now uh, about a, a few of the areas. Uh, I'm obviously not a CFO, um, but our company works a lot with CFOs in terms of helping them to digitalize some of their processes and helps them to um, create this augmentation of technology alongside their uh, existing teams to take away some of the repetitive tasks and some of the uh, more mundane jobs that they have to uh, perform to allow them to do that value-added uh, uh, um, activity that can really help the rest of the organization from a strategic perspective. So I thought what was really interesting from Sandrine's comments about entering invoices manually, uh, that is actually something we've talked to a client about to help them to not only uh, enter the invoice uh, using OCR and then using AI to capture all the information and then start to create the, the database out of it, which is what previously people were probably doing when they were having to manually enter a lot of the information. So it's really interesting to hear uh, an example actually in execution. So, I mean, from our perspective, we've spoken, as I said, to a lot of CFOs uh, across Asia. And uh, what we've really found is, is much what have, has been spoken about today, how the role is expanding and the responsibilities are, are just getting greater and greater. And I think Sabrina's comment of having to do everything is very similar to something that we've been hearing. But from our kind of perspective, when we go and speak to a lot of CFOs, we believe that they sit on a, a gold mine uh, of information and data and content that could so easily be used to spread all this 
you know, implementation of artificial, in artificial intelligence and uh, digitalization throughout the entire uh, organization, because all that content is the fuel that drives AI and being able to understand where that content come from, get it all into one location and really start to uh, utilize it to feed the engine can really help to create so much more uh, efficiencies and so much more ability to, to take away these, these tasks and automate a lot of processes. Uh, and not only were they previously very time consuming for individuals to execute, it takes away the, the issue of potential human error that, that might come into there. So, um, and we've spoken to clients about a whole you know, range of areas. I, I know we only have uh, 10 minutes or so today, so I can't go through uh, everything. But really, a lot of these have centered around things like uh, M&A deal execution, like really, you know, how do you uh, automate some of the processes, especially around due diligence and, and reporting and, and extracting relevant components of data for, the, for everybody to use. There's a lot of manual tasks that have generally been done by individuals in there that can easily be automated through artificial intelligence. And then moving on to just general contract management for your organization, being able to look at all these different contracts, be able to collate contracts together as there's a going on from um, previous years contracts, comparing, and contrasting the difference, really understanding where those contracts are going, being able to have a look at, for instance, obligations under NDA agreements without having to go in and read all those contracts individually, just being able to scan through them all, pick out the relevant information. And then going on to the vendor and supplier uh, management and, and even your own customer management. How do we go in and check all the vendor invoices, for instance? Are we making sure that uh, any of those contracts are not order renewing without us knowing? How do we prevent revenue leakage across all of these areas? Can now be done very, very simply at the top of a button. And then also for greater things that might not necessarily mention revenue, but could have wider implications, certainly around compliance projects. So a lot of our CFO clients are asking us about how did they assess their LIBOR risk? Can they do that automatically? What, what does that mean? Uh, GDPR, you know, there's a lot of concern from some companies, especially in Asia, and they don't really know an awful lot about GDPR, but understand that there are a lot of actions that they have to take. And then other areas like IP management, uh, rent and lease agreements, uh, all these areas can really be uh, broken down into still using sort of AI and something that we've been able to help clients with. Um, but for today, I'm just going to talk about maybe two particular areas, which uh, the first one is going to be about M&A deal execution. And that's something that we really spend a lot of our time with. And that's something that clients uh, really come to us for. But there's a whole raft of issues around there that we can help. I think the uh, uh, content and organ, you know, organization and management. It's a huge component of the MA process. I mentioned automating due diligence beforehand. That falls into there. But especially now in this virtual world, I think everybody earlier mentioned it and talked about that. But how do you, how do you make sure that all that content that is required is properly stored and indexed and properly organized so that it can be distributed to the right people at the right time? Uh, and the right information, uh, maybe not necessarily an entire contract. And where can you put that with cybersecurity concerns and all these other implications that come with that? So, and then really maintaining the confidentiality of that data. It's, it's a huge concern throughout the entire M&A process. Um, obviously, CFOs have to worry about the, the value assessment side, the, the cross-border jurisdictional elements, if it's going across regions, the compliance and regulation components, given the, all the changes that keep happening. So being able to keep abreast of all these and using technology to um, read through all the regulations, understand all the contracts, have a uh, examine all the financial data, all of these elements can, can be done now. But it's always come under the purview of the CFO. And there are obviously many, many other uh, parts to this, as well as the ongoing um, responsibilities that the CFO has to go through. So under this, one of the areas that, while is uh, not forgotten about, but maybe sometimes is deprioritized, is the post-merger integration. So once all the, uh, you know, a lot of focus is done on identifying the right target, making sure that we get the, the right uh, the value assigned to it, making sure that we get our bid in and execute the deal. But sometimes that post-merger uh, component is, is, is not 
put as much uh, emphasis on or has much emphasis put on it. And some clients struggle with the finer points of, but tech can offer support to help that. So for instance, onboarding the newly acquired company contracts, whether it's the employee contracts, whether it's vendor, as I talked about supplier invoices, all this kind of information, how do we uh, integrate that into our existing platform? And how do we make sure that we're examining all those contracts? We're checking for compliance issues. We're checking for maybe duplicative vendors so that we can realize immediate cost savings and going through and, and, and tracking all that contract data and identifying everything. It's a core component of that post-merger integration work. And it's not necessarily uh, an easy thing to do. And it's a generally a vast body of work. So what we've spoken to a lot of our clients about is using AI to go in and effectively take every single contract or piece of information in that post-merger integration process that they want to examine and they want to analyze, going in and using the platform to tag all the relevant components, all the relevant data, all the relevant information, and then taking that and extracting it out of that in a structured data format. And that is when you can actually go and analyze that information effectively, rather than having to depend upon different bits of information everywhere else. And you can do an apple to apples comparison with whatever it is that you're looking to compare it against. And once you've actually created that process of what do I want to tag, which contracts to, or, or data points do I want to tag with that? How do I extract it? And what analysis do I want to do? You can create that process into an automated action. And so you can rinse and repeat either through all the remaining contracts or remaining data points that you would like to have a look at, or, it's something that you could use for future due diligence projects. If you really want to, uh, you know, if you're going to go and do another acquisition, it's learning, it's, it's able to be applied in your due diligence phase in the next um, M&A activity that you, you take on, or it can help you build a, a negotiation playbook in that value assessment and negotiation stage before the actual M&A transaction even takes place. Uh, and even more simply, just for general supplier onboarding, and, and as everyone knows, with AI or machine learning, the more data points you have, the more tags you've created, the more um, phrases that you have identified, the smarter the machine becomes, the better the results that you get, and the better analysis that you can create out of that. So one, and that's one big kind of component to AI, it's being able to create all these relevant, the tags that I talked about right at the beginning. And one of the big things that a lot of the clients we talk to are really interested in is the ability for them to self-train these, um, these programs or, the, or these platforms. And that's not always an easy thing to do. Throughout any organization, I think everyone is generally surprised at the number of their staff who have either uh, have coding experience or, or are actually doing some coding at the moment, whether it be on whichever platform that they might be using. And they can actually use and leverage, those, a lot of guys leverage those teams to help them to, to do simple coding, to help with this kind of information. But what we're seeing now with a lot of AI platforms is the ability to self-train so that anybody can do it. And there's no need for coding experience. So if you can go in and the, the platforms have become so powerful that you can simply identify terms, identify what you want to happen with it, and the technology can go and source and tag and just add on to that as though it's a pre-trained provision that you received when you first purchased the, the, the technology and the platform. So being able to combine all those elements together allows you to automate so many processes with a consistent standardized um, approach to really minimize any kind of errors or uh, any kind of human uh, mistakes that, that might happen, especially in a situation where there's thousands or tens of thousands of data points, documents, or, or whatever it is you're looking at to review. Um, so that's an area that, that a lot of our clients are very interested in and, and, and something that we've uh, constantly worked through and, and applying this, this uh, platform to, to help them do that. And another area, I think I mentioned it a little bit earlier, was on uh, new regulations around data privacy. So this is a really tricky uh, element. You know, there are these regulations everywhere across Asia, but Obviously, one of the big ones that's come in is the GDPR that everybody is very concerned about. And even though in Asia Pacific, as I said earlier, not everybody is fully aware of how they might be impacted or what, what the, the ruling actually is. But 
I think everyone's seen the, the, the trouble and the, the press that Google in particular has suffered from uh, as a result of breaching some of these regulations. So it is a, a real issue that everybody has to be aware of. And the fines are not uh, insignificant. I think it's 20 million euros or 4% of your global annual turnover, whichever is greater. So the numbers are up there and they're something that nobody wants to fall foul of. So a lot of people or a lot of CFOs that we've spoken to have uh, compliance procedures in place to, to protect against this, but the landscape has changed so much as a result of some of these new laws being put into place. So a really key component of this is how we can use technology to help analyze the liability of data and reduce those exposures and being really proactive about reducing our impact of the personal identifiable information or PII, you know, anything that can locate an individual, whether it's name, address, identity number, and anything along those lines. So, and to do that at scale, because especially for e-commerce platforms who have hundreds or thousands of individual customers, it's a really big concern. And if just one of them has any relation to the EU, then you're beholden to GDPR automatically. So what AI and what, what you know, platforms can, can help to uh, facilitate along this process is the ability to analyze thousands and thousands of contracts in seconds or thousands and thousands of different people that uh, you would want to uh, make sure are not beholden to these regulations or you have managed to um, retain their data and not distributed it incorrectly. And that can be done, as I said, in seconds, not, not weeks. And the main part, point to this is that it's not just about doing it once on a one-off process, say on an m and transaction, but being able to set up an ongoing kind of data privacy assessment tool, uh, but being able to on constantly go in and check your data on a regular basis to make sure that your compliance controls are in place and they're doing the right thing. So, if there's one thing that I'd leave today is for everybody to make sure they have reviewed those compliance procedures and that they have a technology platform in place because nobody wants to suffer the reputational risk or the, you know, the, the financial, uh, financial impact of falling foul of some of these uh, regulations. Um, and technology can definitely help. And there's a lot of platforms out there, not only ours, that can, that can help to support in that particular area. Um, and right. the final thing I just want to leave with very quickly, sorry, Jeffrey, but the final thing I want to leave with is what Jeffrey highlighted at the start um, around adoption of technology. It's all very well buying a technology platform and putting it in place, but a really big part that we would always say is that it's digitizing. If you're taking a manual process and just putting a technology platform in place to execute the same task, if you want to go for true digitalization, it takes more than that. It's, it's mindset change, it's, it's a culture shift. Uh, it requires a lot of education for everyone to embrace how a technology platform can really change your workflow, change the way you work and become more value add to your organization. Okay, sorry, that's it. Great, thank you, Peter. Thank you, uh, really need to give you a plot because you actually <laughs> really stick to the, 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 the timeline to sell. Peter, uh, two questions, uh, actually five questions coming in, but I'm just gonna, because uh, some are similar. One of the questions from Sunny is, uh, Sunny's asking, you know, do you mean AI can apply to data, uh, information distribution for M&A deal, but not the process of due diligence procedure? Um, sorry, 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 can you just repeat that? You broke up a... Uh, no problem. You, can you see the chat box? Yeah, yeah, hang on, let, let me I, just, let uh, me just read it. Maybe yeah. that's easier. So... Um, um, Uh, no, so no, it can do both. So, so uh, we can definitely, uh, it, it can help on both areas. So the process of due diligence uh, itself, depending on what you're doing, but reviewing all the contracts or all the different uh, negotiation points or the uh, offer, anything that comes in, in terms of documentation. Uh, and I think Sandrine mentioned it as well, but using OCR and then, then AI, you can go in and examine all the relevant components to those documents and you can uh, drag out the specific components that you want to that you're concerned about or that don't match up with what you're looking for so it can apply on both sides um 
Sandrine is also asking, uh, what are the top roadblocks you'll find with your clients? I mean, um, majority of CFO, not from this team, but from CFO or management team. Um, I, I think a lot of it is, is just what I very finally kind of talked about at, at the end. Well, there's a lot of it is in trust in the technology because when you go in, you, you have to trust the technology is going to, to do what it says on the tin. So a lot of people are very concerned about that and, and how that uh, might impact their, um, you know, the, the end result that they're achieving because you're taking it away from a, a very much a trust in an individual who you, you know and who's done the job, who you can you believe will be able to produce the, 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 the right results to taking it and trusting it in a, in a machine or, or a technology. And especially when it's uh, related to finance and compliance, obviously there are a lot of um, uh, ongoing concerns and, and uh, issues if something goes wrong there. So that, that's one of those really significant roadblocks that we, that we uh, come into, come across when people really like the technology, the, the idea is great, but then it's the liability of what happens if it doesn't work. So ladies and gentlemen, that's the reason why we set up CFO Connects. All of you need to connect together and make sure that, you know, uh, digital transformation is definitely the future and people are deploying a lot of technology. Last but not least, Peter, uh, this is the question that you mentioned just now post uh, merger integrations uh, when, uh, you know, uh, buying something is easy. Okay. The due diligence process, the valuations, uh, you know, they get a great company, but after, you know, the, uh, the M&A process, the integration that a lot of people found um, a problem. Uh, uh, with legacy system and uh, compliance issue and such. Um, you also mentioned that, you know, uh, with the AI and, uh, and, and tech that would be able to identify this issue, can they apply the same before they buy the company? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's um, um, a lot of what we've seen is that as people get more comfortable with it and understand it more, and that's why, and also on that self-training mechanism, is as, you, as people have gone through this post-merger integration, areas have come up that they maybe didn't think about before or were buried or, you know, there's so many things to do that we're always going to miss, uh, they always feel they're going to miss some pieces. So absolutely. So once that post-merger integration work is done, the same new findings or, or new processes that can be implemented as a result of that post-merger integration process can absolutely then be applied to the due diligence on the next project, whether it's an M&A deal or not, as I said, it, it could be anything, but absolutely. And that growing that, that um, uh, center of, of, of uh, processes and, and, and tags and, and um, uh, automation can then just keep, keeps getting bigger and bigger and can be applied to more and more projects. So absolutely. And as you do more, it grows and becomes more effective. All right. Well, Peter, uh, Peter McMillan here. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your presentation and insight. Uh, Lady Chang, if you basically want to uh, uh, reach Peter uh, uh, or his team, uh, Peter, if you can uh, type your email address here if they want to reach you for more questions about um, uh, what Donnelly Finance Solution do, that would be great. Uh, but next, then we move to uh, once you <laughs> have your merger and your company running and deploy all that and stuff like that, the next step is how do you embrace digital future with fintech and uh, innovative technology that drive banking? Um, banking is, I think, the core of uh, CFO functions uh, with treasury, with banking. Uh, that's all needs support. And today we are very grateful to have uh, Guillaume Lega uh, coming uh, to this particular um, events, because CFO Connects to present. Um, Guillaume is the CFO for City Hong Kong. Uh, he's responsible for integrity and control over financial records and uh, production of financial forecasts and monitoring of CFO Hong Kong uh, based entity. Uh, uh, Guillaume, you know, team also operate partnership with uh, city managed businesses function and provide uh, insight, foresight, strategic advice. Uh, the list goes on. Um, he was part of the uh, one of the big four assurance advisory functions. Uh, so if you want to check out uh, the, uh, his credential, please feel free to check out his LinkedIn's. Uh, with the time constraint, Guillaume, I'll pass it on to you. <clears throat> thank you, Jeffrey, and, and thank you to your, your whole team, especially Amanda, who had to spend extra time with me yesterday to make sure my presentation was going to come live. So I think she, she's loading it up right now. Uh, so like you said, I'm the CFO for Hong Kong and I spent uh, 24 years in uh, finance, public accounting, 
most recently, before com becoming CFO of Hong Kong, I was a regional controller for city, and, and that really allowed me to have uh, you know like a broad perspective uh, of <clears throat> of Asia. I was covering 14 countries, traveled a lot, to, um, you know, see people, understand how things work, and, and understand the, the culture in Asia, which is very particular. Uh, and today I want to talk about really the, uh, the context and the business opportunity in Asia to drive uh, digital transformations, uh, which uh, all of you that work in finance, whether you're CFO or not, I think you need to be part of this and be uh, encouraging your business partners to, to go down that digital route. Uh, and, and I'll prove to you today that this is the right thing to do, especially in Asia. Uh, so, if you think about what's going on at the moment uh, in Asia, there's a massive revolution, uh, whether it's uh, financial, mobile, urban, technology, fintech, commerce, a lot of things are happening, a lot of things are changing, <clears throat> and uh, we are a part of it. Um, City operates in 19 consumer bank markets. Uh, you can see the, the dots on the screen here. I, hopefully everybody can see the screen. Um, Jeffrey, can you confirm you, <clears throat> you can see? Yep, the screen's All right, perfect. perfect. All right. Yeah. Uh, so you can see that a lot of these dots here are, are in Asia. Uh, you know, if you include Australia, which is a big market for us also. So a lot of this in you know, Asia Pacific is taking place. Of course, cities is, is, is huge in the US and Mexico. Uh, but when you think about the growth opportunities that's really taking place in, in Asia. Um, <clears throat> you, you, Asia is very diverse. Uh, there's, here's you know, a few things that you might know. Asia has two thirds of the world's population, uh, but only one third of the land mass. Uh, Asia is fairly young and uh, you know, very diverse. Uh, a few things that maybe you don't know is um, uh, Fifty percent of the people live in urban cities. Uh, Sixty percent are um, are in uh, of, of the mega cities of the world are in Asia. We have lots of millionaire, and uh, you know twenty percent of the top companies by market cap are here in Asia. Um, so, it's a very interesting ratio when you think about um, you know a lot of people in in urban cities, uh, very concentrated fairly young and uh, also, you know, very diverse. Uh, so this is really the opportunity that we, you and we are thinking about. Uh, so how, how to convert that into profitability and return for uh, our shareholders. <clears throat> so uh, as we continue the, uh, the, this, this transformation in uh, Asia, um, what you need to think about is, um, you know, what, what does the transformation mean really in, in urban areas? So the, the, the young and affluent people that we're talking about, what are they consuming, right? Uh, well, in urban cities, they go for, you know, coffee shops, they go to, you know, everyday maybe dry cleaning, they get food delivery. Those kinds of things do not happen in rural areas uh, as, as, you know, we, <clears throat> you, you think of your, your products. Also, the, the, the landscape is evolving. The family structures in Asia is, is changing. Uh, a lot of young adults are moving out, uh, you know, earlier than they used to. There's lots of single parents, a lot of couples with no kids. Uh, you know, there's diversity going on. There's you know, LGBT. And, and by the way, if you think about LGBT, they're actually fairly affluent uh, people. So if you think about your customers, LGBT might make a <clears throat> difference as, as this is happening in Asia. Uh, so there is modernizing of some of the traditional values that we used to see. So that's still there. A lot of children still support their parents, their grandparents, uh, but that is you know, evolving uh, uh, somewhat. Uh, a lot of global uh, cultural influences. Uh, you know, you, you can think of you know the popularity of Gangnam Style a few years ago. Uh, K-pop, even in the U.S., you know, very popular. Of course, uh, TikTok, uh, you, you've seen like a lot of politics around TikTok because that's because it is popular, it is working uh, in, in, in the US or, or elsewhere. Um, if you uh, think about the mobile revolution, so there are 2.8 billion unique mobile subscribers in, in Asia. Um, we think by uh, 2025, 
that will turn into 3.1 billion subscribers and uh, 8.6 IoT, so Internet, in, Internet of Things. Uh, so not just the, the mobiles, but whatever you have in your house that could you know, connect to the, the internet, uh, that will turn to 8.6 billion. That's a massive opportunity for, for uh, a lot of us. And, and what it could create for uh, you know, significant economic de development, uh, a lot of jobs, a lot of the GDP is going to be driven uh, from that. All of this is centered around mobile devices. Uh, the, the, there's a the rise of the platform economy. So a lot of these, uh, these, the, the apps that we have on our, on our, on our, on our phones or our mobile device, they're concentrating the consolidated services into one single app. And oftentimes these apps, they are able to improve the experience, sometimes getting even better than the incumbent. Uh, so the other apps that have this kind of service. Uh, so we see a lot of startups, um, you know, changes that are coming directly from, you know, small companies introducing new apps, new services, new products. Uh, in Asia, we have very progressive regulators. We'll come back to that in, in a second, but they're, they're facilitating the development of technologies and, and, uh, and, and allowing the digital improvements. Uh, and, and very importantly, uh, these platforms are fast moving. Everything is happening at super speed. Now, the, the fintech regulations, so like I was saying, regulators in Asia, unlike the rest of the world, are actually embracing a lot of this financial innovation. If you think of the faster payments in, in, uh, in Hong Kong, we, we, we just moved to a faster payment system. If you haven't tried it, please, please do. It's unbelievably fast. If you, you know, connect with somebody else, they get your, your, your payments within minutes. Uh, we also have easier KYC, so know, know your customer uh, in, in banking. We do a lot of this, but other industries as well. When you, you, you validate, you authenticate your, your, your new clients. Some countries are allowing this now with uh, you know, better checking with the, the national ID uh, and that you can use very quickly to acquire new customers. Uh, the regulators that have these sandboxes where we can try new things uh, in, a, in a smaller scale and uh, you know, change it, adapt it to something that works for the regulators before we get into uh, you know, a, a big bank project. And we have also a lot of challenger banks, uh, you know, mainly in Hong Kong and Singapore, but other countries as well, where uh, the regulators have approved virtual only banks uh, uh, that do not have uh, you know, physical brick and mortar branches. Uh, when you think about some of the examples of <clears throat> companies that have done well in this space in the past 10 years, so Grab obviously, established as, as a taxi service, uh, but now you know, expanding into deliveries. And uh, you know, they, um, they, they've been very focused in only, uh, only uh, eight countries and uh, you know, 200 cities, but in eight countries. So unlike Uber and other uh, competitors, they've really focused on eight countries are doing very well in, in that way. Uh, you know, Paytm, uh, so originally from India, uh, so that that is one of those you know, you know platform ecosystem that has is like a super app, and you can send money, buy movie tickets, make reservations. Uh, so you know, growing, growing ex extremely fast uh, in the in the past uh, ten years. Uh, so uh, you know, seven million merchants, lots of daily transactions, and so forth. If, uh, next one, you know, WeChat. So obviously, in the, you know the Chinese app that that started about. 10 years ago also started as a messaging service. And now, you know, you can do everything with WeChat from, you know, payments and uh, you, know, you have an actual balance there of, of money with WeChat. So you know, everybody's adapting to this, right? Including regulators and, and, and clients, but uh, you know, th th this change is happening as, at, a, at a, tr a tremendous speed. So what are we doing about this uh, at City? So we, we have, embarked uh, for many, many years in the digital uh, transformation. So City, just like any other bank, right? Some years ago was just uh, branches. Uh, then it evolved in the 60s and 70s with you know, your corner ATM, <clears throat> then into uh, you know, online banking on websites, and then uh, you know, developing best-in-class best uh, you know, mobile application. And in, in the, the, the ATM was, was actually a slow adoption. Uh, if you think about when it came out, people actually weren't using them. 
it, it uh, you know, it was at the same time that gas stations and public transport and candy dispensers were, were being rolled out and they, they had limited uh, adoption by customers. There was some kind of psychological fear there. And it's, it's not until there was a snowstorm in New York when people, the bank, uh, bank branches were closed and, uh, <clears throat> you know, people needed access to their money. And then suddenly they realized how um, easy it was to use the ATMs and to, to pull out some cash. Uh, so it, sometimes we need kind of a, a driver to, 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 um, to help adoption. Uh, other times, really, it's a question of proximity, and that's how we see it. We want our products and services to be as close as possible to our clients, and being in your pocket is 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 actually you know the best, the closest we could be to you. Uh, so we're we're rolling out you know things like pay with points. So you buy a coffee, you get a text message, you want to pay you want to pay for your coffee with your points, and we just deduct that balance immediately, and it's all done. And global wallet, we uh, we allow you to. To, to preset, pre, uh, pre-buy, pre-purchase some, some foreign currencies. And uh, if you go to Japan and you, you buy something with your, your debit card, we automatically recognize that you've just done a transaction in yen and we debit your, your yen balance instead of your, your Hong Kong dollar balance. Uh, what we, uh, you know, if, you, if we show a little bit of the, of the timeline of what happened with city in Hong Kong. So, the first consumer branch, we, we've been in Hong Kong obviously for longer than that, but in 1962, we opened our, our, first, uh, our first branch. Uh, and then yeah, we went through some phone banking, mobile banking. And we, we, in 2017 really is when we transitioned to a more digital ecosystem. And uh, you know, last year we launched, uh, uh, or two years ago, we launched an open API. I'll come back to that in, in, in a second. Uh, but, you know, in 2019, we launched a remote account opening. So now you can open a bank account, a credit card, really on your phone. It recognizes your face, takes, uh, takes a look at your Hong Kong ID, and you can open your account very quickly. Uh, and, you know, this year we signed an agreement with Hong Kong TV Mall. So those of you who don't know Hong Kong TV Mall is the equivalent of Amazon that we have in the U.S. Uh, so Hong Kong TV Mall, you know, one of the biggest delivery company. Um, it, when you check out with Hong Kong TV Mall, it, 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 it asks you whether you want to apply for a city card. Of course, there's all kinds of benefits from, for doing it. But more importantly, it doesn't actually go to the city app to uh, approve your credit. It, it resides inside the Hong Kong TV Mall application. And uh, that's, this is what we call open API, right? It, we, it's sort of a merge uh, in between uh, multiple uh, systems but we can live in our, our, our customer, our partner's applications. And that's again, how we get as closely as possible to our customers. So th the way that we view the progression into a digital uh, strategy is really driving, innovating, responding that becomes part of our DNA. Uh, and I was talking about API, uh, you know, API really allows us to connect where our customer is. Again, prox proximity is, is the key in, in providing our, 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 our uh, products and services. Uh, and it, it's, it's about being responsive to what's going on in the market and not having necessarily the, the flashier app. We like our app, we think it's great, but the products and, and services that you provide are, are more important. Um, it's also about driving engagement. So we want to proactively uh, find the, the, the needs of our customer. Then they have, uh, they'll, they'll less likely to be uh, calling us about uh, with, with questions. Uh, so some very important uh, aspect of what we do is what we call MVP, right? The minimum viable product. So when we launch something, it's about having enough features in, in, the, in the app or the product for, to gain early adopters of, of that. And then from there you grow. So you launch your product, even if it's not, you know, fully complete for the best for, for everybody addressing all the needs, you launch something, you start small. This is how WeChat did it, right? Amazon did the same, uh, right? Start with something small and you evolve from there as you gain more popularity with, with adopters. Uh, it's also about mindset. Uh, and this is, critically important for finance people, right? You have to adapt or you're left behind. I think some of the presenters this morning also talked about this. Uh, if, you, if you don't adapt, you know, you, you become like a book retailer that's completely taken over by, by Amazon, right? And we as finance people have to do that for our own work and push our, our business partners to, to do the same. Um, 
Ion, I, I hate to rush, but uh, we That's are okay. uh, slightly running out of time. Yeah. 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 All right. So, so I. I think that that's it really, uh, you know, my big message here is that disruption happens fast and, uh, you know, what to do next, uh, you know, maybe look at the last part of the, you know, the on the previous slide, uh, um, where we talk about what's going to happen next. So, uh, we think that 5G is absolutely something that everybody should be watching for. Uh, video could become the predominant uh, media of communication with your customers. Uh, and, and when you think, of, think about advertising or um, anything that you do with your clients, really, you have to think about something that's going to, uh, you know, communicate much better than, than static media. With that, uh, sorry, I was going a bit fast, but um, I'd be happy to take your questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Guillaume. So we have two questions, uh, one from actually both of them. I mean, I mean, this, um, uh, I mean, actually asked this question before you, 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 the, the writers started your presentations, um, relation to, um, Hong Kong, uh, so greater Bay area, uh, do you see overall banking industry will be benefit from, um, um, greater Bay area from Hong Kong? Ab absolutely. Absolutely. So, no, so, so this sure. is a, a, um, yeah. a massive topic for us. Uh, so allowing, um, sort of the cross border, if I could call it that way, uh, banking or any, any other financial services uh, to for, for customers in the greater Bay Area to access Hong Kong products and the other way around. Uh, I think the development of products will accelerate as a result. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll have we as a business will have to adapt to this new new uh, new clients. But yes, absolutely. How has five G transformed the mobile banking? So as I was saying. Uh, you know, 5G is, is the next thing that, that we're really watching, that we're preparing for. And, and I think everybody, uh, no matter your industry, you should be prepared for this. Obviously, everybody wants to do things with their phone. Well, guess what? If the phones are faster and uh, allow for more video interaction and, and whatever it is, uh, you better be ready, uh, have your business ready to, to, to deal with that uh, because your, your competitors will, will take over and, and then you, you'll become irrelevant. For some reason, I don't know why, I just got this hunch feeling that Sandrine could actually use your platform to sell a lot more masks. Um, so I'm joking, Sandrine. Uh, and, and, uh, and banking uh, uh, no longer just basically providing loan or anything like that. It's actually providing a lot of um, uh, technology and method that can actually do business easily. Uh, thank you, Guillaume, for your presentations. And I know that you work very hard to uh, present today. Uh, I do hope that we can actually meet you in person uh, once the, the uh, uh, the infection is slowed down, we can actually get uh, in person. Now, last but not least, uh, we'd like to be, uh, welcome uh, our next and uh, final presenter for today, um, Sarah Chow. Uh, we'll talk about uh, innovations and agility to ensure better business outcome. Sarah, I'll pass to you, please. Um, Sarah? Yeah, hello. Sarah, um, I believe that you are the CFO for Medicine Pacific, a tricol company, and you, uh, I mean, like all the uh, presenter here, you have over 20 years experience in management and financial services industry. Um, so uh, what uh, you are going to um, bring to the table? And can you hear me okay? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, um, yeah, thanks everyone. Uh, and thank you for that introduction. Um, uh, so leadership, people, people skills and innovation are very, very important topics um, and they have been discussed uh, many times over in the past, uh, but they seem to be uh, never go out of style. And in fact, um, it has become very important uh, in today's environment uh, with all the global uncertainties. Um, so I think it's very important for us to, to understand um, leadership and innovations and how they can help us to navigate uh, through all the uncertainties we're all facing. Like you said, I have 20 years of experience, uh, people management experience, and I um, actually managed people uh, both at small private entrepreneurial companies um, and also, um, you know, small companies that, you know, changes in decisions and how and I have people in large uh, public Fortune 500 companies where processes and decisions are more complicated. Yeah. 
a whole different meaning. Um, additionally, uh, the people that I've worked with are located uh, globally from the US uh, to Europe and also here in Asia. Um, can you guys do all hear me? Yes. Hello? I can hear you perfectly. Yes, yes. It, it goes Hello? in and out a little bit. Can you? Yeah, we can hear I you. I seem to have lost you. Oh, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. You know, let me, uh, sorry, let me, let me switch to uh, a different, uh, <laughs> I think I've been on the call for the last couple hours. Uh, I think I may have been running out of battery. Hold on for one second. Sorry. No worries. Well, Sarah has actually figured out the uh, technical issue here and such. Uh, um, again, uh, 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 we're back to uh, my co-host today, David. Most of the presentation today, uh, were you surprised or is basically what you expected? Yeah, I think it's more reinforcing than, um, um, than changing opinions. Um, I think as expected, we've heard, we've heard from people from dis different um, financial sector, business sectors, and um, some of those sectors are finding um, COVID has been a bit of a boost and some are finding it's been a bit of a, bit of a nightmare. So, <laughs> you know, uh, um, I don't think there's any great surprise in that, but um, I think the one common theme across everything is that technology is transforming everybody's world at the moment. And um, as, as Guillaume mentioned, the disruption is happening very, very quickly. So um, you've got to get on board that bus or else you're going to be left behind. Okay. Um, Sarah's back. Sarah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Um, I'm changing to my, uh, my old technology, the hardwired <laughs> earbuds. Um, so, um, um, so I just wanted to uh, say that in my experience uh, through working for small companies, uh, that decisions, uh, uh, actions move quickly uh, from, you know, working experience, working for large companies, for, Fortune 500, 500 companies where decisions and uh, processes are more complex. Um, so my, my experience over, over the years um, really tells me that um, there is one thing that's, uh, that's the same innovation and people skills are needed in order for these companies to, to all be successful. Um, so and what, what does innovation mean? I think everybody knows that it's you know, it means that um, it's improving something that already exists or introduce something new. Uh, but there are millions and millions of innovations out there. And what makes um, the innovations, for example, created by Steve Jobs or Mark, Mark Zuckerberg's revolutionary? Um, well, their, their innovations has one thing in common, and that is that they are connected uh, with people, consumers, and a deep understanding of people's evolving needs and based on their current conditions. Um, and then they innovated technology to meet those needs. So the simple examples are, um, you know, Steve Jobs envisioned the demand and growth of uh, personal uh, uh, portable computing, uh, which led to the development of Apple computer. And also the, uh, another example is the, you know, first uh, Macintosh word processor with font choices, which was such a novelty at the time, but now that it's uh, been taken for granted almost. Um, same thing with, with the pocket-sized devices, like the first iPod with thousands of songs on it, uh, which you can listen to anywhere. So, um, and then same thing with, uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, who created uh, Facebook, uh, because he saw the, uh, uh, foresee the people, foresaw people's desire of, for online social network in early days. So when it comes to um, innovation, all these technology giants have one thing in common, and that is uh, their products and services are all with people in mind, and they force out what people wanted uh, before everyone else. Um, but when it comes to people's skills uh, to drive these innovations, um, they all seem to have a very, very different, uh, different, different way of managing, but they all worked in their favor. Uh, for example, you know, Bill Gates believed in the value of input from his employer, uh, from, from his employees to drive the company's success. And um, he, he may not be as creative as Steve Jobs, but he has utilized the ideas and advice of his team to pr produce some of the biggest technology game changers. Um, on the other hand, you know, Steve Jobs didn't really quite understand the benefit of working 
uh, as a team with his employees and he was more of a dictator than a leader. Um, even though he wasn't very easy to work with, but that was compensated by his extraordinary creativity. And uh, he really developed some of the products um, that he saw best fit for people, right? He was quoted as, as saying that people don't know what they want until you show it to them. So, and th this really helped Steve create it, uh, the products that he knew the consumers uh, wanted. Um, so having said all that, what does it all mean? Um, and how it ties back to our reality. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, using Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg's examples. Um, um, they are extraordinary CEOs um, who saw needs uh, to revolutionize digital computing and online social network. Uh, for them um, to continue to be successful, they really have to continue to innovate because otherwise uh, they will fall behind, right? And I think it's the same for all of the companies out there. Um, I, and I believe that uh, for leaders, leaders at, at all levels, not just the CEOs can affect change by promoting innovations and creativity in the same way, um, especially in today's environment where a lot of opportunity exists. Um, and I think one group of leaders that I can clearly see that can drive innovation and techno technological change is actually the C CFOs. Um, so in today's environment, having a uh, technology enabled platform to run uh, your company efficiently from anywhere has become increasingly critical to every business as you know, previously mentioned. And just think about and, you know, how much we rely on Zoom, WebEx to conduct virtual meetings these days uh, with anyone from anywhere in place of in-person meetings. And also understand you know, how today's market demand will evolve due to the pandemic and being able to foresee uh, corresponding consumer uh, behavior changes, uh, consumer trends, and being able to run a technology uh, efficient, versatile, platform to deliver services to meet these demands, I think it's the really key to success. Um, and it, it is no different from how Steve Jobs created Apple Computer, Mark Zuckerberg created Facebook. Um, so CFOs are really in a perfect position to drive technological change, uh, such as digital transformation. And that's because, uh, like some of you have said earlier, that CFO has the best visibility of many critical data not just uh, finance information, but you know, sales, supply chain, uh, marketing, uh, business performance, uh, understanding these critical data and the connectivity of how to utilize uh, the data is the key to making the right decisions and to achieve efficiencies and to better serve, uh, better serving clients. So, um, so really uh, in conclusion, there are um, you know, many leadership qualities, right? But I think it all boils down to, at the end of the day, two qualities that are very, uh, very important and that will make a difference. And one is innovation and one is the people skills that will drive the innovation. And I believe, this is my last sentence, <laughs> I believe um, a leader who can foresee the evolving market demand and, and have the cre creativity to meet those demands will be far more successful than the leader who just follow rigid practices and principles to, to keep the status quo. Great. Um, thank you, Sarah. Thank you for your insights. And uh, it's almost yet that you're um, helping me promote uh, CFO Connects community. That's basically the entire message we wanted to, uh, to, to convey. But I think you conveyed it better that um, CFO is actually the forefront of innovation and we do need um, to move forward with that and such and such a thing. Uh, I do hope that, like I say, uh, we find a, a a time and place that we can all gather and then talk about an issue that really um, challenge to you and also uh, uh, help you grow. Um, before we go, I think we are over time for about almost half an hour. Any questions for Sarah before we conclude today's um, uh, webinar or events? Um, because of due to time, so I think we have to close this now. Um, David, do you have any final comments on this? I did actually have one question, maybe for okay. Sarah. Yeah, go ahead. Um, it's, it's a very lovely thought about the CFO uh, helping to drive innovation. I love that a lot. From my personal experience, when I've tried that in the past, it's very easy to fall over the fact that the, the companies expect the CFO to be almost like the bastion of not changing and to be the, the, the guy that maintains the status quo and is super safe and doesn't take any risks. So um, there's, there's a natural conflict there between maybe 
if, if you have that mindset as a CFO, but actually the company maybe expects you to be a different type of person. I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's sometimes it is difficult for CFOs to actually uh, make these changes and people think that you're actually, you know, you're, you're doing things that are outside of the box, right? So CFOs are expected to be the bookkeepers and doing reporting and analytics, right? Always the back shop. But the CFO, like I said, is um, the one that actually sees the whole process, right? Uh, so not only, like, for example, uh, when I first joined my company, I um, uh, converted the, uh, the finance software from a, a desktop-driven uh, software to a cloud-based, right? That has really improved the process significantly. This is before the, you know, all the Hong Kong protests, the pandemic, right? Because without that software, we would not be able to, uh, you know, work from home and operate our financials from anywhere, right? So that alone uh, tells you, and then we have other opportunities like that to be able to automate, uh, to make, put, put things on the cloud instead of re relying on servers. And that will not, so from operation standpoint, and also from a commercial standpoint, that things that, and then we have to make all these systems talk to one another. So, so it's it becoming a technological enabled platform. Not only it'll make things uh, work better, but it, it will also save money and also allow people to work from any locations, right? Because a lot of times if you're working in certain areas like the commercial or the operations or you know, compliance or some other back shops, or you may not see the whole picture. Um, so really, I think it's really up to the CFOs to be out there to promote themselves um, based on the, the information and the, the knowledge that they have of the company. Right. Well, thank you so much, uh, uh, David, and great question, sir. So uh, up until to, uh, today, uh, I didn't really believe that David about his um, uh, complaining about I have to do everything as a CFO. Uh, now I actually really, really understand the pain that you guys have to go through. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much for your time and uh, efforts, and thank you all the panelists and speakers for your insight. Uh, thank you, David, uh, for contributing to the knowledge. Uh, Peter, as well as uh, Guillaume, Sarah, Chris, Joe, uh, York, as well as Sandrine, that just left us uh, because she has uh, other uh, appointments. Uh, thank you, uh, all the participants, uh, and thank you. And I hope again uh, in the next couple of months, we'll hope to have a networking event, a cocktail networking event planned for everyone. Thank you so much. Right, bye bye. Thank you. Bye.